So in this video, we're going to dive more into user defined functions to get a better idea of generally what functions are going to look like when they're disassembled and get a better understanding of how we can parse out each part of the actual function and better understand how functions generally work when they're run through a compiler like GCC. So what we have right now is I have this like really basic int main and inside of here, I have three variables declared a, b, and c. They're equal to four, five, and two respectively. And then I run this function add to using these three variables. And you'll see here that add to simply takes each of these variables, it adds them all together, stores the result in sum, and then returns sum as a result. And then we just set that into a variable D and we return that as the exit status code. So this is a very simple and straightforward application. So nothing too complicated here. And I've gone ahead and compiled this already. Very straightforward. We just do a simple compile. And then I also loaded it into Ghidra. Again, you create a project and then you just take the binary and click and drag it in. And you can run that default analysis and you'll be good to go. So inside of this, we're going to start inside of the main and we're going to talk a little bit about how the stack is generally working and how these variables are generally being loaded and just get some intuition behind these types of ideas. So first things first, what does the stack look like when this function first starts up? Let's draw it out. We have this stack here. And I'm just going to remind you that in assembly, we grow our stack from high addresses to low addresses. So generally, when you see these different instructions, the push of RBP at the very beginning is going to put RBP onto the stack. And then this instruction right here is actually just going to move RBP to R R RSP into RBP, right? So everything is going to be pointing up to this same location here. RSP and RBP are both right here. This subtraction of 10 from RSP creates space on the stack. So it moves RSP up in the stack. So I would remove it, move it up you know, somewhere, maybe here, for instance. So I just want you to understand that that's what that's generally doing because we're moving from high to low. This is moving up in the stack to create space in the stack for us to be able to work. And then what we're doing is replacing values onto the stack. And I know that because we have this D word pointer and then these square brackets that indicate the location on the stack itself. So this is moving data onto the stack. Now, how do we generally decode exactly what's going on here? Well, what happens is Ghidra actually helps to create a little bit of a simpler picture of the actual stack memory itself. This RBP plus local 10 is saying take RBP and then we add a value to it. And this value actually represents the position in the stack and it moves from smaller to larger. So generally the way that you can look at this is you can say, okay, three things are being moved onto the stack. And when we're looking at from the Ghidra perspective, the lowest numbered one is the lowest value in the stack. So this one is local 10, which will just label as 10. This is 14. This is 18. So when these are moved onto the stack, what we have is the following. We have two, we have five, and we have four. This is what we get out as the resulting stack. So you can see that this is two, this is five, and this is four. So generally, this is what our stack looks like at this moment. Now we're gonna do some really interesting things with the actual stack and the variables, and it's related to the way that the compiler actually optimizes its use of registers. So we're gonna see some really interesting things happen with these different values. So this next set of instructions, these five instructions here, are actually setting us up for this call to the add to function. So this is the actual function call. The Everything before that is actually the setup. So we're moving these values into different registers. So we're going to move edx in, we're going to give it a value, which is local 10, which is two in this case. So edx has the value two. ecx is going to get the value of local 14, which is five. And then eax is going to get the value of local 18, which in this case is four. And then we do a little bit of shifting around. So we actually move some values into esi and edi. So we move ECX into ESI. So now ESI stores the value five. And then we do the same with EAX. EAX gets moved into EDI. And this sort of shuffling around may seem a little odd, right? Why didn't it just move these values here directly into the registers? 
there's a reason for this. Basically, as GCC is going through and compiling our application, it doesn't necessarily know that these values are all going to be used inside of a function called parameter, for instance. So what it does is it first places them onto the stack, and then it only places them into registers when they're absolutely needed in those registers. Because there's a finite number of registers available to us, we don't want to be using registers when we don't need to. So that's why this happens in two steps like this. The movements into ESI and EDI are generally because ESI and EDI are reserved registers that are typically used for function calls. So what we do is we populate those registers first, and then we set aside other registers to be used for additional parameters. And if there was a case where we had too many parameters, we would just put them onto the stack and then reference them from the stack themselves. That's generally the way that this is going to look. So at this point, this is the structure of our memory, right? So we have our stack memory and then we have our actual register set as well. And at this point we call add two. So let's go over to add two and let's go ahead and take a look. So now inside of add to, what we have is we have some interesting things generally happening. When we come into this, we of course do the same sort of setup that we usually do. We place RBP onto the stack. We move up our RBP and RSP pointers to those particular locations. And then what we do is we take each of these values that we had in registers and we place them onto the stack. This is typically what we do with things like local variables in functions. The reason that we do this is because we want to preserve what we were given when we first started this function. The idea being that we probably are going to want to use some of these registers in the function. So we preserve those values in case we need to use those registers for something else and we want to overwrite them. That's the reason why we're placing these onto the stack. So again, same sort of principle as before. We're working from smallest to largest as we're placing these values onto the stack. So we have 1C, we have 20, and we have 24. And we're just placing these values onto the stack from smallest to largest, right? So it's going to be generally seen in the same sort of order as what we had before. So that's the main thing that we're keeping in mind when we place these values onto the stack. So we're going to have 1C, we're going to have 20, we're going to have 24. And generally, 1C gets EDI, which is going to be 4. And then 20 is going to get the value of ESI, which is 5. And then 24 is going to get the value EDX, which is 2. So that's the way that those values are currently stored. So at this point, you can basically ignore everything below this. It's really just this part that we're focused on right now. Now check out what happens as we go through this. What we do is we move into EDX, the value of 1C. We move into EAX, the value of 20. So let's just erase these registers. They aren't really relevant anymore. We don't really need to worry about them. They've been stored on the stack, so now we can do other things with them. So EDX is going to be given the value of 1c, which is 4 in this case. And then eax is going to be given the value of 20, which is 5 in this case. And then we're going to go ahead and do an add instruction. So remember that add stores the result in the left register. So edx is going to be equal to edx plus eax. That's what that instruction is doing. So at this point, edx is now going to have, well here, I'll just uh, overwrite it here. EDX is now gonna have a value of nine, right? Now watch what happens next. It moves into EAX, the next value that we need to add onto the total, which is 24. So this EAX is no longer needed. So we just erase it and we change out its value to two as this instruction is doing. We then do another add. We add into EAX the value of EDX. So now at this point, EAX is going to be equal to EDX plus EAX. So that will give us 11 as a result. So now this has the value 11. So at this point, we now have our result. This is the final answer that's required by our function. Now, something I want to address right now is, so the add instruction can only take in two arguments, right? The destination and the source. So one question you may have is, why doesn't it just load all three parameters into registers and then it can add to the two and then add to the last one on? 
The reason why it doesn't do this is because it's trying to use as few registers as possible. That is one of the goals of the compiler is to use as few registers as it can. So what it does is it does the first add operation and then it simply overwrites the register that it doesn't need with the next value to add. That allows it to use only two registers rather than using three, which would be optimal compared to having to use all three registers. This is something that you see if you start to learn more about like building compilers and how compilers work. They want to minimize the number of registers. So that's why you see this done like this in two steps instead of loading everything into registers and then doing two adds in a row. That's generally why that's done. So then the next little piece of code is basically going to take that value EAX and it's going to place it onto the stack so that it could be used later. So it takes this 11 and it stores it somewhere on the stack. So we could just like say like, you know, it places it onto the stack here. And then generally what it's going to do is it's just going to move the value back onto EAX just to make sure that it's stored in EAX when it's returned back to the original function. And then this pop is going to get us back our return address, and then we're going to return back to our main function. So let's just finally go back to main and see how this program ends off, just to understand that general idea. So we're going to go back over to main. So right here. And you'll see here in main, the very last thing that it does is it takes this local C, which is 11. Sorry, it's a little bit hard to see, but that's the 11 that was stored there. And it is taking the EAX value and it's placing it in there. And then it's retrieving EAX as a result. So at this point, EAX has the value 11. And remember, EAX is the exit status. So that is being set to 11, which in turn gives us that return of 11. So with this, you now understand exactly how to walk through this whole function setup. And it's very useful to be able to do this because you want to understand, you know, where these parameters are coming from and what the stack memory is looking like. So if you can do this breakdown, it makes the reverse engineering a little bit easier to understand exactly what's going on. Now, of course, Ghidra gave you this nice, clean little set of C code here, which works very well, right? You can see that it actually does work fundamentally the same way. It adds these values together. It gives us that result, and it returns that result. But what Ghidra didn't show you was that we had three variables declared with these values before we actually did that add. It shows them as constants, which wasn't necessarily the case, right? We actually declared them as integer variables. So by looking at the assembly code, we can more clearly see that these are being stored in memory somewhere, which gives us a bit more of a full picture towards the way that memory is actually looking, which is very important if you're starting to do things like, you know, trying to find exploits or you're trying to really decompile and build out that understanding a bit better. So with that, hopefully you know have a better understanding of how functions are generally used inside of assembly code. And hopefully this helps to highlight the idea of, you know, the process of actually calling a function and retrieving results from a function using the stack when we're working inside of these assemblies. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.